this Hangout on air is live. Terrific. Wow. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, we are now live for the Google Hangout to discuss Band Books Week 2014. Uh, it's called Band Books Week 2014, A Look Back. Uh, this is recording, and I will have to admit that we are pretty new to this, most of us presenters. So um, if there are any uh, technical issues or uh, any instances of confusion, we apologize in advance. My name is Jonathan Kelly. I am the program officer at the Freedom to Read Foundation. The Freedom to Read Foundation is one of the sponsors of Banned Books Week. Um, and I want to take the, a moment to just thank all of the sponsors who made Banned Books Week 2014 such a success. Uh, they are the American Booksellers Association, American Booksellers Foundation for Free Expression, the American Library Association, the American Society of Journalists and Authors, the Association of American Publishers, the National Association of College Stores, the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, National Coalition Against Censorship, National Council of Teachers of English, Pan American Center, People for the American Way Foundation, and Project Censored. This group worked extremely hard and diligently um, for months in advance and during Banned Books Week to make sure that the public had uh, the ability to know about and celebrate in their own way and in their own communities, as well as in virtual communities around the world, uh, the celebration of the freedom to read and to bring attention to the issues of censorship. One way that the Freedom to Read Foundation was involved was by uh, creating a series of grants. We have done this now for several years, and it's through one of our funds, the Judith F. Krug Memorial Fund. Uh, Judith Krug was the founding executive director of the Freedom to Read Foundation in 1969, and uh, one of the founders of Banned Books Week when it started in 1982. And in uh, her efforts uh, to bring awareness to how libraries, booksellers, authors, publishers, and others uh, protect and defend the freedom to read and advance the causes of the First Amendment um, and access to information is pretty legendary. Uh, we, uh, through the Freedom to Read Foundation's Judith Krug Memorial Fund, have given um, dozens of grants over the years, and most of our presenters today will be talking about the projects that they put on uh, it, this year um, with their funds from the Krug Fund and uh, these are some of these projects are very much replicable and could create ideas for you uh, in your own libraries, community organizations, universities, schools, bookstores, etc. in thinking of projects for 2015 and beyond. Our presenters uh, are going to be Nanette Perez, who's uh, my colleague and the program officer at the ALA Office for Intellectual Fre Freedom, Susan Brown, director of the Chapel Hill Public Library in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, uh, Dana Knott and Julie Zavaloff at uh, Columbus State Community College, and Catherine Azelford, the uh, director of the uh, Northern Virginia Fine Arts Association in Arlington, Virginia, at the Athenaeum in Arlington, Virginia. I think I got that right. So we are going to start with Nanette Perez. And uh, Nanette, I'm going to go ahead and make you the presenter to everyone. And she's going to talk a little bit about projects uh, that she worked on uh, as coordinator. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nanette Perez, like Jonathan said. I am the program officer for the Office for Intellectual Freedom. And I'm also the chair of the Banned Books Week Coalition Committee. Uh, the sponsors and I have done a lot this year. We have um, set up various chats on Twitter. Um, we also um, hosted various events across the country. I know that Project Censor did a uh, radio uh, spot and celebrating Band Books Week. NCAC did a Twitter uh, trivia game. Um, but we usually tend to focus on the Band Books virtual readout. And, this year, Sage Publishers, we partners with Sage to host a virtual readout booth at the ALA annual conference. And all of those videos are featured on the Banned Books Week YouTube channel. The address is uh, www.youtube.com slash Banned Books Week. Um, in addition to the, those videos, uh, a lot of 
schools and libraries across the country uh, pre uploaded videos of their own, and they are also featured on that website. Um, we also have a wonderful video created by Dave Pilkey, author of Captain Underpants, and he is the top most frequently challenged book of 2013. I highly suggest that you check that out, as well as videos from uh, Jeff Bridges, The Dude, <laughs> um, Lois Lowry, author of The Giver, uh, Anna Castillo, uh, a band author, and just many more. So please check it out when you have a chance. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you, Nanette. Um, if anybody has questions for any of the presenters, we do have a Q&A box. And um, looks like we have our first one, which, Nanette, I'm going to go ahead and give to you. Uh, and that says, was it just among my circle of social contacts, or did Band Books Week really strike a chord with the general public this year? Nanette, you've been uh, in this business for quite a while. You've seen Band Books Weeks come and go. Was this year different, in your opinion? It was in the sense that we really worked with the partners to get things going. Um, we were more coordinated this year, uh, so I think that helped a lot. Great. And um, when people were doing the videos uh, in the general public, where were you seeing that most of them were coming from? Were they from a specific uh, community or area or um, can you, is there any, are there any sort of generalizations you can draw from who were participants this year? Uh, I believe that a class in a college, and I can't remember which one, it was a communications class that uh, had their, uh, the, the professor had their, had, had their students upload videos of them reading from their favorite band book. I do know that there was a high school here in Chicago, and the name escapes me right now, that also participated. They sent in 70 videos, a lot of libraries, um, hosted events. Uh, some actually did promotional videos, like Mooresville Public Library in Indiana. Uh, they did something a little different, and that's the kind of stuff that we'd love to see. I mean, in addition to people reading from their favorite band book, um, anything original would be wonderful. What did, what did they do specifically? They uh, did a, it was like a domino of books, and it's just, it, just check it out. It's on the Band Books Week YouTube channel. Very cool. So the URL for that is www.youtube.com slash bandbooksweek, correct? Yes. And that's where this uh, Hangout will be archived for those who would like to see it in the future. Great. Thank you so much. Again, if you have any questions for Nanette or any of the panelists, please put them uh, in the Q&A um, uh, tab. There should be a tab on the left. Is that how it works, or, or on YouTube, I guess, uh, there is a Q&A um, that uh, we can then read. All I know is I saw a Q and we got an A for it. All right. Well, thanks for that. Uh, Nanette, I'm going to go ahead and move along and invite Susan, uh, formerly from Lawrence, Kansas Public Library, or go ahead and present you, now with the Chapel Hill, North Carolina Public Library, to talk about her uh, award-winning uh, present uh, projects. So go ahead and take it away, Susan. Thanks, Jonathan. Can you hear me? Yes? Sure can. Okay, great. This is my first Google Hangout, and I'm just generally awkward with video chats like this, so uh, I'm just going to dive right in. Um, the biggest challenge will be keeping myself to 10 or 15 minutes. There's a clock over my head, so that's what I'll be looking at. Um, thank you for having me uh, be a part of this today. And I'm here to talk about these guys which are our Band Books trading cards. These are the original set from three years ago um, that were done um, thanks to the generosity and the good fortune to get a Krug, Krug, Krug grant um, from the Freedom to Read Foundation. Um, so I have some slides to share, but I want to start by talking about how this project got started. Um, and this is definitely one that I want to come back to that is scalable and um, replicable. And also the question that you got about whether or not the message of Band Books Week continues to resonate beyond the community of people um, that are involved with it. I think it definitely does, and I have some stories to share about that. Um, so people ask me how we got this idea and how the project got started, and I tell them it's just an idea that I had for a while. Um, I had been thinking about it for a while, and this is terrible to say. 
and I'm sorry to everyone, but I'm just going to be honest, I've gotten a little bit tired of Band Books Week in the sense that most places I worked did a display and did a reading list and maybe did something, but it was I kind of felt like the same thing was going on. Now that's different now that I've gotten much more involved and I see all the great projects. So I didn't know enough then, but my perception at the time was Band Books Week was the same thing every year. Um, so I had this idea that had been cooking in my head um, and then I had had some folks say no to it um, when I had pitched it and then um, I got the money for it thanks to the Freedom to Read Foundation and we had a new director in Lawrence who was open to new ideas and he said yes to it. So he green-lighted the project and we had the money. So the idea was simply what it is. It's banned books trading cards um, and the idea was to ask local artists to create works of art um, that were somehow inspired or based on a band book or author. Um, so the first year that we did it, and feel free to ask questions, I tend to kind of ramble, um, I'll get there eventually, but if I'm not making sense, just ask a question in the Q&A. Um, so the first year we did it, we had the money and we put out the call for artists. Um, at the time, and still, Lawrence is a very artsy community, it's a college town. Uh, it's a, I always get the colors wrong. It's a, sea, it's a little piece of blue and a sea of red or a piece of red and a sea of blue. It's a very liberal progressive college town in a generally conservative state. So um, the intellectual freedom message resonates there uh, as well. It's a very artsy community. And at the time, Lawrence was really trying to um, maximize, its, or maximize that arts focus and leverage itself as an arts community. Um, so we put out the call for artists and then we sat and waited. Um, I'm going to start my slides here because otherwise I'll keep talking and I'll forget them. So let me pause real quick and make sure that I can do this. Okay, hopefully everybody can see those. Um, yeah, we sure so, can. Okay, so these are some of the cards from the past um, and the present. But anyway, so one thing that we learned the first year is that artists are procrastinators extraordinaire. So we put out this call, we're all jazzed up for this idea, um, we put out the call for artists, uh, and then nothing happened, and then nothing happened. And we gave them like eight weeks, um, and I had like by the uh, three or four days before the deadline, I think I had four entries, and I was like, oh my gosh, I don't even have seven entries, because the idea was to do one card per week. Um, and then I extended the deadline for a week, and then in something like four days' time, we got like 42 entries. So one thing to learn if you want to replicate this project is artists are procrastinators, and that has held true for the next two years that we've done it here in Chapel Hill. So we got 40-some entries. We convened a jury. Um, we asked the director, um, someone from the local art center who was a partner on their project, and someone else. I think it was a local author um, to serve as jurors, and we did a jury selection. I had never done a call for artists. I had never done a jury selection. I was flying by the seat of my pants. Um, so one of the other takeaways throughout all of this is find partners where you can, unless your uh, library is experienced with doing arts-based projects. Um, so we got someone from the art center to not only serve on the jury, we also got someone else there to help us even understand how to do a jury, how, how to um, run it. Uh, then we chose seven cards. Um, we reached out to a local printing company to talk about printing them, and then I learned about things like bleed issues and borders and high-res printing and all of that. Um, you'll see on this screen, part of the gist of them was to make them feel like trading cards. So on the lower level, those are or on the bottom row, those are the backs of the cards. So the idea was to make them uh, reference and kind of feel like um, trading cards for sports. So where you would have stats about the baseball player, these have sort of facts and stats about the book and the artist. Um, so we did that. We um, had them printed. Uh, we also decided that um, we wanted all of the submissions to be in an exhibition. So we did an online um, exhibit and then we also did an in-house exhibit. Uh, and we got ready for the week. Um, we had of the seven winners, we had large format um, sort of uh, blown up on foam core, uh, like two by three, three by two um, posters printed. And so we had one of those in the lobby each day. So when you walked in, and so the idea is, let me back step, is we reveal one card each day. So the trick is to get the full set, you have to come in the library every day for seven days. Um, and then we also wanted to maximize the sort of 
surprise of them. So we unveiled one card each day. Um, so in the lobby, we had a large format of the card. Each day, we unveiled them on our website and Facebook, and then folks could come into the desk and get them. Um, and just to show you, just to uh, let you know on the screen here, the Animal Farm is the first card from Lawrence three years ago. The Charlotte's Web card is last year's first card here in Chapel Hill, and the Leaves of Grass card is this year's first card here in Chapel Hill. And when I say first card, that's one of the takeaways in here. One of the things to think about if you if you ever think about doing this project is, um, I say start strong. So when you choose your seven artists and you think about um, people, our community now has done it for two years, so they know about it and they expect it and they are. Um, excited about it, but if it's the first time you're doing it, you want those fir that first card or two to be really, really strong. Um, and these were all really strong. I mean, they're all great, but um, you want those first ones to sort of be some of the best ones. So these are all the Sunday card. For Susan? Each. Yes? I want to interrupt real quick, um, because I think all that's showing up for us right now is uh, slide number three with the, uh, oh. the Kurt Vonnegut one. So on the that's left side, I think you're going to want to select the slides from your... Um, outline rather than doing any presenter um, slide share. There we go. Now we see the second slide. That's got it? Okay. Awesome. Sorry. I was just oh. rambling on and oh. got it. No, what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, so can you see them full size? Is this big enough to see? Because on my screen it's tiny. No, it looks good. It looks good. To okay, me. great. So again, that's the first card. The Animal Farm was the first card from the Lawrence year, was the Sunday card. Charlotte's Web last year. Walt, Mit Walt Whitman Leaves of Grass this year. Um, and then you can see, again, the backs there with that tra kind of trading card feel. So um, how to tell the story of that first year. <laughs> so a couple of things I'll share. One is um, I presented the project to our board of trustees in Lawrence, and someone on the board said, you know, you ought to print a few more than you think you need. I think these are going to be really big. And I said, mm, okay, I'll print like, you know, or I'll hold back like 20 more. Um, boy, she was right. So if you were to pursue this project, always print more than you need because you want to give them away to muckety mucks and PR people and send them out to the media. Um, so to tell the story of that first year, uh, let me change slides real quick. Or not. Did it change? No. Hmm. Jonathan, now I'm not getting anything to change. Oof, bummer. I might have to get my Media Lab guy to come back in here. Okay, well, we did have one question, and which might be on a slide, but uh, the question was where can we, or can't, oh, there it changed. Okay. There might be a little bit of a lag, but uh, there is a question. I don't know if you're planning to address it, but can we still get these cards and where? Yes, you can, and I'll tell you all about that. I'm going to force you to listen to me talk, though, first. <laughs> no, you can still get the cards. Um, you can shoot me an email, or I can direct you to the website. Our friends group sells them, and they are still on sale in Lawrence as well. Um, so year one, we put up the Sunday card, uh, which was that Animal Farm card, and we put it up on Facebook. I was the marketing director at the Lawrence Public Library. We put it up on our website and on Facebook, and I was sitting at home, I was having a cup of coffee, and the first one went up at like 11 a.m., and by 11.30, I start getting all of these pings on my email, um, and we had a pretty good social media reach then, um, and it's even better there now in Lawrence, and I had a librarian in Maine email me, and she's like, I love these. Can you send me a set? And I said, sure, absolutely, not a problem. I, you know, kept 20 or so back, and then like an hour later, I had like 16 of those emails, and then overnight by Monday morning, I think we were up to 40, um, and we knew that we really had something. So we um, continued to unveil the cards on social media and our website, um, and then we, by, I think by Tuesday was when the Huffington Post called us and said we, we, we would like to do a story on this. Um, and then we realized that we were getting so many requests for free ones that we decided to set up sales. So overnight from Tuesday to Wednesday, I did an artist agreement, like a contract with the artist to get a cut of the money. Um, we set up a PayPal account, none of which I had ever done, um, and immediately started online sales on Wednesday. Um, 
which we still do here. They still do in Lawrence. We still do here in Chapel Hill. So I learned a whole lot about PayPal. That first year, we shipped them out um, to every state in the union and internationally. They went to New Zealand and Australia and Scotland and all kinds of places. So the takeaways from year one, um, it was a media blitz, I call it. We had the Huffington Post. It got picked up by the AP. Uh, the um, oh, the not the New York Post, but another New York magazine. It got picked up widely. It was just crazy. Um, but we also realized it's great fodder for social media. So again, we had a pretty good social media reach, um, and this really helped us. It's a great visual to share, and if you do uh, social media, then you know that um, visual helps. Uh, this whole sales setup was crazy, but the takeaway was really that we were, I think in general, folks tend to plan for failure, like what if, if this project bombs and we forget to plan for success? Um, and so we were, we, were, we were scrambling to catch up to the success rather than planning for it. It was a great year. We got asked about swag. Could we print these as posters? Could we print them, screen print them on t-shirts? Um, all kinds of things, and the artists loved it. Uh, the artists got great exposure um, and new contacts as well. So that was the first year. Um, I'm going to move on unless there are questions. I think I figured out how to advance my slides. So after that, I will also say um, the project won a John Cotton Dana um, award for Lawrence Public Library. Um, and then right after it won that, I left. <laughs> so I accepted the position as director of the Chapel Hill Public Library right after that. I came here in May of last year, May of 2013, and I thought, well, Lawrence will, oh, well, I hope that Lawrence would keep doing the project, and I didn't know what kind of staff I was walking into here. Um, I will say that I was lucky enough to take my first directorship two weeks after they opened a brand new building after a $16 million renovation. So I knew that I had a great new building, but I wasn't sure if staff would have any interest in the project. And luckily, both Lawrence uh, continued to do it, and my staff um, stepped up here in my first month and said, we love this project. We think that it's great for Chapel Hill. Let's do it. And I said, OK. Um, I will also say we were so grateful to the Freedom to Read Foundation for making this happen. If you do sales, um, the project essentially pays for itself. Um, the printing cost is actually fairly low, so it can turn into a self-sustaining project. When we did it here, we asked our friends and foundation. Um, I said on this slide, it was a new project for a new era. The library here um, was a brand new building, but a fairly traditional mindset. So this was a really great project for me and for the community and for the library to show a library can be more than just checking in and out books. Um, Lawrence, Kansas is a college town, and Chapel Hill is a college town, so it really makes sense. They both have very engaged intellectual arts communities. Um, I will also say, as a sidebar, um, I think this project really dovetails nicely with the arts community because um, they often also they also often face challenges to their intellectual freedom, and so you know there's always issues about some piece of art that people deem controversial. So it's a really nice dovetail. Um, so this is one of the cards from this from last year here in Chapel Hill. Uh, I'll mention two things here. Um, one thing is the thing that I tell folks that think about doing this is to make it about the art. Um, you can go down the path, and here I'm, I've been on the jury last year and this year. Um, you need to make it about the art first, and not necessarily about any kind of message. And what I mean by that is. Um, Sometimes when you get into the jury selection of the seven cards, and the first year that we did it here, we had about 48 entries. This year we had, I think, 76. Um, they want to make it about, okay, we should have a children's book represented, and we should have a book that's been banned for um, sexual uh, themes, or we should have a book that's been banned for violent themes, or we should have a female author represented. And that's one way of doing it. But I think the lesson I've learned in three years of doing this is you make it about the art first, because the art is what grabs people. And then you bring them into the message of the individual book or author, but also the message of intellectual freedom and banned books week. I hope that makes sense. Um, but judge on the art first. The other reason that I chose this particular um, card, which is for Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, is um, you can not only um, pay for the project through the card sales, but we also did a silent auction last year. So one thing that we did in Lawrence and we did here to generate interest and um, buzz for the project is 
The first card is launched on Sunday, but on Friday we have a sneak peek party where we have the exhibit up, we have all the artists there, and we do a sort of um, unveiling of the cards before everybody else can get them. And at that event, <clears throat> we have done a silent auction for the seven winners for the last two years here in Chapel Hill um, with a minimum $50 bid, and I think at mm, both years we've made between seven and $900. Um, so that's a really great thing to think about, too. And generally, the artists are fabulous to work with. They love the project. Um, they will donate their pieces um, and things like that. So that was last year. I'm going to start being really mindful of my time. Year three was this year in Chapel Hill. This is, Chapel Hill. This is one of my favorite cards from this year. Um, this is the third year doing it. It gets easier, especially... Um, now that I don't have to do it, I have great staff to do it. Uh, but it gets easier every year you do it, and it's sort of become our marquee um, event, one of them. It's really um, a great event that people look forward to. Um, and this year's takeaway was to, to continually add value. So what I mean by that is this year um, we decided to do a youth division um, as well, so we encourage youth artists. I mean, the project's always been open to artists of any ages, but we encourage youth artists, and we have a special um, division for them. We also, one of our partners here in Chapel Hill is the Office of, Chapel Hill is fortunate to have an Office of Public and Cultural Arts, um, and they run the call for artists for us, um, and we pooled our money and were able this year to offer each artist $100 for the winning, so the seven winners each get uh, $100. Um, we also realized that Band Books Week, the following weekend after Band Books Week, is the town's um, arts festival, which is a major arts festival. I don't, I think like 15 or 20,000 people come. So we decided to take a mobile um, exhibit of the project to the arts festival and actually get a booth with the artist in the artist's way, um, which was really great and added value for the artist so they get more exposure and the project gets more exposure. This year, thanks to continued funding from our friends and foundation, we were able to, we offered originally two or three hundred and ended up giving away seven or eight hundred sets to classroom teachers in the Chapel Hill schools. Um, and so they used it for curriculum that week and gave them to kids in the classroom. Um, so we're always thinking of ways to add value and to make the project fresh. Go on to my next slide, which I forget what that actually is. Let me see. Nope. Bear with me. Just a second. Susan, while we're waiting, we just have uh -huh. about three or four more minutes. Just to Okay, up. great. I swear I'll shut up soon. <laughs> okay, um, a couple takeaways. Print more than you think you need if you want to do this. Consider the art first. Partner where possible. Plan for success. You've heard me say all these. I'm going to skip to a couple more um, to another slide to show you some more of Here's some more images um, from various years at Chapel Hill and Lawrence. Um, and finally, if you have questions about the project or if you're thinking about running it, um, there's my email, there's my phone number. Um, I'm going to turn this off, I think. Hang on. If I can and get my face back up there. Okay, there I am again. So again, um, it's a really fun project. Um, I, think I, I think I had a slide in there that I may have skipped. Um, is this right for you? Would this work for your library? I think if your community has, an, has a strong arts community or is trying to push their arts community, if you live in a town where or a city where um, intellectual freedom um, is an is a engaging issue or not, you could make it one. Um, if you have the capacity for it, it doesn't. It seems like it takes a lot of work in a certain sense. Once you get it going, it, it kind of runs itself, especially if you have partners. And it can really pay for itself. The first year, we really lived in the realm of $1,500 from the Freedom to Read Foundation. We spent every bit of it. Um, but I think the project could be done for well under 1000 So that's me talking a lot. Oh, I think my favorite story from this last year when we did this, um, we 
the week before Banned Books Week last year, um, and this was the first year doing this project here in Chapel Hill, uh, Randolph County, North Carolina, the Board of Education voted to um, remove Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man from the curriculum. Um, so I had been pitching the story to the local NPR station, and they were sort of like, well, maybe, we don't know. And then when that came on, when that came out, they were like, yeah, can you come on and talk about banned books? Um, so it was a really, from a marketing point of view, I was like, really, Randolph County? You're banning a book the week before Banned Books Week? But it got um, much more project, or much more notice for the Banned Books Week project, and was a really interesting turn of events. Um, Thank you so much, Susan. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I actually had a couple of follow-up questions. Uh, number one, um, just for we'll put this in the in the YouTube uh, video after we're done. But can you let people know again where to get the cards, both from you and from Lawrence? Oh, yes. So um, her website is less than easy to navigate. But what you're going to do is go to ChapelHillPublicLibrary.org, um, and somewhere on there you will find a link for this. That sounds terrible. I can put it out there. If you also, they're actually sold through our um, friends of the library group. I'm looking on my phone now. Uh, Friends of the Chapel Hill Public Library. We can probably get and that's that. where you actually do it. But you can also get there through our website. You just might have to dig a little bit. We're gonna make. We're gonna have a better website by the time we do this next year. <laughs> Great. And then one and other. Lawrence is the uh, Lawrence is the same way. They'll have. They have a better website, so you can probably find it much more easily on their site. One other question. Um, they're they're we're calling them trading cards, and I've got all of them from both cities as well as uh, I think DC Public Library did some last year you with did. the uh, uh, Roller Girls, uh, the Roller, um, not Roller Girls, the uh, roller, roller Hockey, do mm -hmm. Roller Derby participants, and they're, they're fantastic. Um, but one thing I would never do is trade any of them away because I like them so much, so really uh, they're, they're very much collectibles um, more, than, more than trading in some ways, would you say? They are, and so again, I was the marketing director there, so I took the, the sort of marketing license with calling them trading cards. Um, the idea, though, you know, someone had the idea of well, you could do it nationally, and people could trade them back and forth. Um, but yeah, the trading card piece of it is really just a hook. I will say that um, people have sent me pictures of what they've done with them. Um, so I had someone send me, and I actually want to do this. They had a piece of mat cut. If you think about a like long horizontal piece of mat and then they had seven holes cut out so that they could display like each card in a row. I also had one of my favorites was someone sent me a photo the first year. Um, they had lined all seven up and then they had gotten pictures of the, of the or they had gotten books and set the books up with them and kind of made this shrine to ban books with the trading card and the book that it was based on and it was really great but people um, People have people think of them more as collectible art than truly trading cards. They are art, and I, I when you put up the one on um, from uh, Brave New World, it just reminded me how much that the one with the pills. It's it's just so striking and, and beautiful. Yeah, so many great things have come out of that. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank um, you. And you didn't go too long, and um, I am now going to, to switch. Actually, I'm going to switch back to Nanette real quick. Um, because I do want her to ask, answer a question from uh, Justin at Uprise uh, Books, which is, uh, any news yet regarding a Band Books Week theme for next year? We loved this year's focus on comics and graphic novels. The timing was perfect for us, given that Rose City Comic Con coincidentally started the same weekend. We, 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 pl we planned that, Justin. Uh, no. Uh, so, Nanette, do you want to tell us um, what my ideas might be or how people might give them ideas to you? Well, we are considering a few different themes. Uh, one is on diversity um, or young adult novels, even maybe more specific and go into uh, LGBTQI issues. Um, but we are, we will be sending out an, a survey uh, about Banned Books Week um, through our various social media outlets. Uh, and one of the questions on there is the theme. So if you have any ideas, well, one, well, sorry, please first off uh, do the survey and share your ideas there or you can also email our wonderful 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 uh, program coordinator for Band Books Week her name is Maggie Jacoby and her email address is mjacoby at gmail.com and uh, she'll be out of town uh, on a much needed vacation until November 10th but please uh, send her ideas but really we really want to hash this out by December so you should know then.
that's it. Thanks, Lynette. I just wanted to add that, uh, again, that Maggie did a, a bang-up job for uh, Band Books Week, and I think one of the reasons that it did strike a chord with the general public this year is because coordinating events and um, media for 10 plus different um, sponsors of an event is not easy and she sort of heard the cats and allowed us to really to get a, a, a group message together and uh, get it out to the public far greater than we have uh, ever in the past. Um, Nanette mentioned social media. I just want to give a quick plug. Uh, just on Facebook, it's it's Band Books Week. On Twitter, it's Band Books Week. On Google Plus, it's Band Books Week. Um, we saw this year that our Facebook fan page got over a hundred thousand. We're up to over a hundred thousand fans now, which is uh, amazing and allows us to get the message out much bigger. One of our uh, probably the most shared thing I've ever seen involving banned books by far uh, came from uh, the town, uh, the 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 town of Columbus, or the uh, the the. Columbus State Community College, and I'm going to switch over now to uh, Dana, um, not and Julie Zavaloff, who are going to talk about their project at Columbus State Community College. Are you guys there? Hi, we're here. Can you hear us? Sure can. Go on ahead. Okay, um, I'm going to start. I'm Julie Zavaloff, like Jonathan said, from Columbus State. Um, I just want to thank Susan for sharing those trading cards. Those were great. I actually went to KU, so I'm not surprised at all that that town really embraced um, such an artistic idea, and I wish I were doing that. And loved your public library when I was a student there as well. So, um, and then I just want to start out by thanking the Freedom to Read Foundation um, for the grand opportunity and for putting this event together today. Uh, Dana and I are actually going to focus mainly, like Jonathan said, on the which band book are you quiz that we created for our library. Um, I think we're going to open our slides right now. Let's see if this works. Does everybody see those? Yep, looks good, looks good. Okay, um, so the first day we got together, Dana and I, to work on the initial grant application, this idea for the quiz came up immediately. Um, from day one, we really wanted all of our Band Book Week programming to have this kind of interactive element to them. Um, again, piggybacking on what Susan said, um, I've never participated in Bands Week before as a librarian, but as you know, a library patron, I have noticed throughout the years that it just kind of seemed like you know another just you know um, opportunity to do a display. And when Dana and I were discussing you know how we wanted to do this, we really wanted the patrons to be able to interact and create the content and have it be something a little different than us just displaying information about Band Books Week and intellectual freedom and things like that. Um, we really wanted them to they were actually participating. So as soon as we learned that we had been awarded the grant, we started working on the quiz. Uh, we found an article, I think it was actually in Huffington Post, with the BuzzFeed editor who was actually responsible for um, their quiz popularity. And she gave a really interesting interview about their process and. Um, one of the best tips that we found from that article was uh, start with your results. So create, you know, determine what possible results are going to be, write those descriptions, and then work backwards. And if we hadn't read that article, I don't know that we, it would have occurred to us to do that, and that really helped um, through the process. So mainly what you're seeing here in this first slide is, you know, the results of working backwards and trying to come up with this kind of aesthetic look and a design to the quiz. We had a bunch of different concepts, as you can see here, um, and we kept fleshing it out and fleshing it out, and ultimately we ended up choosing uh, this kind of barbed wire prison design. Um, we're going to switch to slide two here. Um, hopefully you can see this. This ended up being our final decision. We had created a Band Book Week team out of um, a bunch of different departments at the Columbus State Library and you know Dana and I would work on the design and then we'd bring it back to the team and we'd get feedback and then we would kind of make changes that way and we also knew from the beginning that one of the other larger events that we were going to be doing for Band Book Week was the mugshot booth so we kind of said well let's just stick with this idea of 
you know, the Miranda rights and caught reading and this whole criminal aspect. And um, that's how we ended up with this, you know, prison font and, and the uh, barbed wire vector graphic that you see here, which ended up being the one that we shared. So, you know, with our branding board here, which is the next slide, um, you can kind of see how that development of the quiz impacted the way that we designed everything else that we did for Band Book Week. And, you know, we had a lot of programming that we knew we wanted to do. And, you know, everything from coming up with the tagline, which is Exhibit the Right to Read, which became the website, to these kind of 50s mob-style wanted posters. We kept this, you know, black, white, and red theme throughout the entire um, project. And we wanted all the marketing and content created from the events to look similar. We thought that this would really help with producing participation within the community. If, it, if, if it, we started early on with this marketing, and we started way before Band Books Week, I think we started um, late August uh, with some of the initial marketing so that we could kind of get a little bit more buy-in. And, you know, we, we had these, um, the bookmarks that you can see down there in the lower row um, to the raffle booth, to the mug shots, caught, band, uh, caught reading. Again, this all kind of went back to this whole Miranda rights element that we, that we stuck with. Um, so, again, we wanted everything to be really interactive. So I'm going to turn things over to Dana now, who's going to talk to you about our social media aspect of the events. What's kind of interesting, uh, the use of social media at our library is, is fairly new. I believe we started out with just a Twitter account. And then over the last couple of years, we started adding more social media tools, such as Facebook. We have a Tumblr blog as well, Instagram, Pinterest. So we've really spent some time trying to build up how our library uses social media. Well, it was kind of interesting when Julie and I uh, started the planning for Band Books Week, we really just were focused on just the Columbus State community at first. We are like, you know, social media would be a good way to interact with our students. Uh, I'm at our Delaware campus, and Julie is at our Columbus campus, and we also have little regional learning centers where our students go, too. We are commuter campus campuses, so our students, you know, just come for classes, and so we thought social media would be a good way to reach them. So at that point, we really weren't thinking beyond kind of our community. Well, the surprising thing about social media, I mean, when you're out there, you're just not one community. You, you have so many other people and libraries that you can connect to. So uh, it was kind of interesting, as uh, especially with the popularity of the, the quiz growing, how not only were we kind of having these fine relationships with our community members, our, our library, our students, but then we were connecting with other libraries and other organizations as well, and they were really playing a big role in sharing our content. So it is really amazing how, you know, you start out with the local view and then something becomes really national as well. It was just amazing. And I think one thing that was kind of funny is that Julie and I started seeing even the quiz shared on our own personal Facebook pages where our Facebook friends were taking our quizzes too. And we're like, wow, this is something else. It's kind of funny. Uh, Julie and I actually got Tropic of Cancer as our results. And it seems like a lot of people selected Bread, Paris, and being a writer is their option. So I actually had someone joke that we were uh, giving money to the uh, Henry Miller estate <laughs> there. One other thing, as Julie mentioned before, with BuzzFeed, uh, we really started out thinking about, yeah, these BuzzFeed quizzes are popular, and we've spent a lot of times just seeing what soft drink we are and things like that on BuzzFeed. So we really thought, hey, let's see if we can use BuzzFeed as a tool. Unfortunately, at the time, uh, BuzzFeed did not allow community members to create uh, quizzes. So what's kind of interesting has now changed, of course, after Band Books Week. But we found that we can use BuzzFeed lists. The community members at the time could create a list. 
So we also did 20 life lessons learned from reading band and challenge comics. And so we had showcased really 20 popular uh, band comics. And we really wanted something that would uh, embrace the theme with that as well. And so that was uh, shared 3,756 total views. And the only downside with the, the BuzzFeed community uh, list is that there really wasn't a good way to search it. A lot of times you had to provide the direct link. And so we really relied on that kind of being shared through social media as well. But, you know, at this point you guys now can create a community page for your library and not only do lists like the one that we have with our 20 life lessons learned, but also you can start some quizzes. You can see that these are kind of the different uh, social media tools that we used. Uh, one thing that we were kind of surprised on, although we had a lot of our content shared, we're still trying to work on, on building our audience at our library. But uh, Twitter, we had 6.6 thousand impressions, and that's basically any of our content being shared on different pages or in searches. So that was always great. Uh, we also did story booth videos. Uh, one thing that Julie and I really wanted to make sure of, not only would we have kind of the interaction between the library and the community and beyond, but we also wanted to have a lot of content produced and, as our name suggests, exhibit the right to read, we wanted to have exhibit material. So Julie's currently working on kind of our gallery through our website, which will archive kind of these events. So we do have a library YouTube page where we have really wonderful videos where people aren't just reading passages but also sharing stories that when they encountered censorship or issues pertaining to intellectual freedom as well. With our mugshot booth, we actually had over 200 mugshots taken. We have a partnership with the Delaware County District Library and we actually set up our mugshot at their library too. So they got to have fun participating as well. Uh, one thing that was kind of interesting about Pinterest, uh, we initially thought about having a film festival, but it would cost $250 per film for the, the licensing. So that seemed a bit cost prohibitive. So we're like, you know, let's go ahead and just create a Pinterest board where we can kind of showcase uh, popular films based on band uh, banned books as well. And so we did that and we also used Pinterest to uh, create boards on uh, graphic novels and comics. And so of course our awesome website uh, is a great place uh, and if you visit it soon it's uh, library.cscc.edu slash exhibit and that way you can kind of check out more of our content as well. But again, I think uh, one thing that really skyrocketed uh, was uh, the quiz that we created. Uh, because BuzzFeed at the time did not allow community members to create quizzes, uh, Julie and I discovered PlayBuzz. It, it seems like it's a tool that pops up quite a bit in Facebook feeds. So Julie was able to go in and create this fabulous quiz and it was shared 329,000 times. And it was just amazing how quickly that took off and, and resonated with people as well. And when we were reading it, we uh, reading some of people's reactions, uh, some of them were like, oh, I've never heard of this book before. I'm going to go check it out. So it kind of connected them maybe to a band, book, band or challenge book that they might not have been aware of. It put things on the radar. So I think definitely we would love to continue doing something like this every year. So I guess we're kind of curious to see if other libraries might start creating their own quizzes because now that there's PlayBuzz and now BuzzFeed is allowing people to create quizzes, we might have some competition next year. Yeah, and I'll just interrupt real quick to talk about um, the concept of planning for success, um, a little um, story to kind of you know, show that that concept is that when Dana and I created the quiz, we thought initially, oh, you know, maybe 100, 200, 300 people 
we'll take it, you know, maybe it'll be like our moms and our friends and things <laughs> like that. So when it's when the numbers really started to kind of get up there, and, and I remember the first number that we freaked out about was a thousand. So you can imagine what the week was like for us as it continued to go up and up and finally end somewhere around 329,000. Um, and, uh, you know, that was just a really, it was a really fun experience. You know, we don't get to do a lot of um, programming like this at a community college. Again, we have commuter students. We don't have dorms. It's a totally different kind of environment. And, you know, so professionally, it was just an incredible opportunity to kind of see something like that take off on our campus and nationally. I, I have a quick question, and that is, did you get the results of which were the most uh, frequently answered books or which people are most, which books are most people? You know, it doesn't tell us that in PlayBuzz, in the stats. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, we actually uh, did it at our library, at some of our and I think we were kind of split between Tropic of Cancer and The Hunger Games. <laughs> but uh, I remember some librarians who took it uh, were saying, oh, we're getting a lot of Tropic of Cancer. And I'm like, well, keep on picking Ryder and Harrison <laughs> Red, you know? So. Maybe a librarian. Uh, we we also got an email, was it an email, I think, from somebody who wanted a little bit more information about the quiz because they were going to be running a poll on their campus, not just from their librarians, but I guess their entire college, like they wanted the entire faculty to take it, and they were going to be sharing the results locally with their community, and we, we have not heard back from them yet, but it does seem like maybe that was an idea that people had to kind of keep track for their own community. Now, Jonathan, did you take it? Uh, <laughs> yes, I, oh. I did. I, I took it a, f a couple of times, so I ended up being. Yeah, I different <laughs> what were your results? Oh gosh, it's been so many, so many weeks. Uh, yeah. <laughs> was it, Nanette? Do you remember what I was? I do not, but I know that I was Tropic of Cancer. There you go. <laughs> I, I wasn't that though. Um, okay, well. Uh, one other thing I just want to say that I thought that the Pinterest board was fantastic. Um, it's a social media that I think a lot of um, uh, people don't necessarily think of as their first go-to social media, but it does have quite a community there, and uh, it just it's so visual and it brings people's uh, minds. You know, it, it, I think it really um, unleashes the imagination. So certainly something that people can consider uh, in the future. So. Right. Our, I'm still to share videos too from YouTube. So if you do have like readouts or story booth videos uh, on YouTube, you can also pin them on a Pinterest board. Well put. Well put. Good point. Um, I'm going to move on, and we're going to bring Catherine on board. Catherine, you can go ahead and unmute your mic. There you go. And um, Let's see, present to everyone. Okay, you have the board, so I'm going to let you go ahead and talk about your efforts. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, first I have to tell Dana and Julie that I got Tropic of Cancer when I took your quiz, and so did my 87-year-old mother, so that was kind of fun. Um, you work for a community college, and Nanette works for Band Book Weeks, and Band Books Week pardon me, and Susan works for a public library, but I work for an art center in Alexandria, Virginia. We partnered with the Alexandria Library System, and the first reader in our band book readout was Rose Dawson, who was the director of the Alexandria Library. Um, I really like the idea of band book trading cards, but the reality of working in an art center where a portion of the purpose is to be an art gallery is that gallery events are planned years in advance by a curatorial team, so that wasn't really an option for us. However, when we had the readout, we had art on the walls by a photographer named David R. Allison, and the wall, you'll see this if you look at the readout, if I show you that, the end wall where we positioned speakers, poets, musicians, where we positioned the readers for Band Book Week was featuring uh, under icons, the exhibitions called Icons of American Culture, was featuring um, a jock strap and a baseball cup, and we had the town crier for Old Town Alexandria standing there reading from Captain Underpants, which I thought was really kind of fun. And he referenced the fact that he was reading from Captain Underpants. And the mayor, of, the vice mayor of Alexandria stood in front of this and read from the Grapes of Wrath, so that was fun too. Our programming was really aimed more at getting people into the gallery readings, performances. We did have a band book, um, a band book exchange, 
and we constantly had people coming in. We, I don't think we ever had more than six banned books in our tub of banned books, but they were a different six just about every day because people would come in with a book and take a book, which made me really happy because it meant that we were circulating them. We were making certain that people got to read banned books that they hadn't already read. And our two biggest pieces here at the Athenaeum were the readout and a banned book, uh, what did we call it, uh, library survey. Survivor. And I'm really appreciative to the Freedom to Read Foundation because those took a little bit of money and because of the grant we were able to do that. Um, at an arts, a nonprofit, money is always tight, so we can't present some of these programs without grants. Thank you. The um, points that I would like to make are if you do, if you replicate the kind of programs that we had, you're managing a lot of people. We initially had about 20 people who wanted to read at our readout, and I was pleased that we only had 15 read because 20 would have been too many. And the readout was to have been followed by a discussion. Some of our readers went on for 15 minutes or 20 minutes where we had planned on them going on for five. <laughs> so when you have 15 people and three or four of them go on 10 minutes longer than you expect, the evening ends late and we actually wound up not having the discussion but we had a reception where there was a lot of conversation about banned books. One thing I noticed that was different with our readout this year from our readout last year, last year people got up and read and then we had, an inform we had a reception with a very informal discussion. This year our first presenter was a marvelous man, he's a publisher and an attorney, but he had to leave. So he said, I'm gonna, how about if we start with me reading from the decision to allow Ulysses to be published in the United States. And so he read this decision and took some questions about it and I think that may have set a tone where other readers felt that they should discuss their book before they read it. I think it was less effective this year than it was last year where people got up and read and then when the readout was over they talked. Um, our final event, which was the Library Survivor event, was a lot of fun and it was a little easier to set up because initially I was communicating with actors who were uh, who specialize in comic improv and trying to get five actors together when one of the actors introduced me to the rest of a comedy improv team so they were able to work together and they were able to rehearse together and they knew each other's timing and it was really fun and since you mentioned Tropic of Cancer I will tell you that the book that did not get voted out of our imaginary library was The Grapes of Wrath and the books that were voted out were Alyssa Strada, The Great Gatsby, Lolita, and, ooh, I can't remember what the other one was now. Oh, Ulysses. Ulysses was voted out of the library. But that was something that many people came to, stayed and talked, and that's what made me happy is that we had the exchange of ideas. Uh, we used your quiz, and we posted the many, many marvelous logos that the Freedom to Read Foundation, or rather that the American Library, Found American library Association has published to our, to our Facebook page. And I, we did reach people who were commenting through Facebook, but I think mostly our reach was local. It was people who live in the Alexandria and Arlington areas who came to our gallery to attend one, either the readout or the library survivor or to exchange books. Or we had one other event. We had a lecture uh, called Banned and Buried, the Sordid History of Books by a classical historian, Lauren M. Hammerson, who came and talked about banned books of antiquity. So we brought people in and were able to disseminate information and to encourage discussions. Uh, there was an online presence contributed by our partner, the Alexandria Library. Athena Williams, and I love the fact that she's Athena, the goddess of wisdom, is, is her namesake. Uh, Athena Williams created a banned book quiz, which was on the uh, Alexandria Library website, which was also a fun thing to take. Um, I'm saying um a lot, and that's not good. Catherine, I, I'm not sure that I don't Catherine, know that I have anything else to contribute. Catherine, I have a quick question for you, and then in the interest of time, we'll probably wrap things up. But could you just sort of go over how? Two things. Number one, how did the library survivor um, thing play out? And then secondly, if you uh, can let people know about the video that you have. Okay. Well, the library survivor was an idea that initially I had, that we would have five actors play banned books. 
and that each actor would make the case as to why his book was important and the audience would ask the actors questions and they would have to defend their book and then we would vote four of the five books out of the library based on the TV show Survivor and I immediately planned on getting actors who specialize in improv. I'm an actor myself. In fact, we're working on a project to hopefully raise some money for the Freedom to Read Foundation through something called Hope Operas. But I'm not an improv actor. So I needed to find actors who did the sort of improv you see on Whose Line Is It Anyway. And as I was asking around the actors who I know who do traditional scripted work but who also do improvisation, I came across this group called Pork Chop Volcano. And I went to see them at a club in my area. And I asked them if they'd be willing to do this. And I was able to pay them through the Freedom to Read Foundation grant. And they came and they performed at the Athenaeum. We were not able to tape it, unfortunately. Um, and it was a full audience. We kept bringing in chairs. And after they performed and they were the subject of the vote, they all went outside because we have a garden outside our building while the audience voted. And they came back in and mingled with the audience. and. People had enjoyed the reception and talked about banned books. As for how the um, as for the as for the YouTube video, we've put it on YouTube, and I can send the link. I can also do the screen share where I play a little of it right now. Yeah, why don't you just show like thirty seconds or a minute or something of that? And while you set that up, I just want to let everybody know that if you are in the D.C. area, there will be the final performance of the Hope Operas um, that are raising money to the Freedom to Read Foundation. A little plug: just go to hopeoperas.com, and you can find out where um, to go to see the uh, tremendous uh, community-inspired theater. Um, it's five different plays that are serialized, and the audience members then at the end get to vote and uh, which which of their plays was the best, and that money goes to benefit uh, the fa the charity that is selected by the um, the creators of the play. So it's been a great fun project to follow from Chicago, and um, hopefully get a nice crowd for the final show on Monday, October twenty seventh. But go ahead, were you able to figure that out? Yes. Oh, gee. So it wasn't. <laughs> I thought it was playing. Let's try it again. Um, screen share. Entire screen, share. Can you see it now? Can you see it now? Yep. Go ahead and enlarge it. Okay, this is our first speaker. His name is Ron Goldfarb. Uh, it looks like we can't hear it, unfortunately. Well, I'll tell you up. what. I will. I will mute it down, but I will move over to show you our town crier who wears <laughs> colonial garb. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, and who was reading from Captain Underpants, which I thought was fun. And he referenced standing near some underpants. And then, okay, that might have been strange. <laughs> so I'm back. All right. Um, yes. So that was... I think a very effective event. Again, it did not have the social media reach, though our band book quiz created by the Alexandria Library had some reach. It was far more a community event, but we had well over uh, 50 people for each event into the gallery and then folks who were coming in sharing books. So I was very happy with it. I have to say the year before we had C-SPAN come in and videotape our readout and we didn't get that this year. So we did have someone come in and tape it and edit it and that's what you were seeing and that is under the YouTube channel Athenaeum NVFAA. Uh, Great. <laughs> thank you so much Catherine and I just want to thank all of our participants uh, Nanette, Julie, Dana, and Susan as well for their time um, in our first Google Hangout. Uh, again, as you know, this will be archived, so we'll post it on the website. Um, there was one other question that we had, which is where can uh, we learn about planning for Band Books Week 2015 activities? And the answer to that is just stay tuned to the website bandbooksweek.org. Uh, we have a blog on there and uh, we will be continually sharing our plans over the coming months um, when, the th when the theme gets decided, which will hopefully be by the end of the year or early 2015, um, some of the artwork, 
uh, when the Krug Fund, the Freedom to Read Foundation's Judith F. Krug Memorial Fund grants are open, which will be in the spring, and uh, all sorts of other things. All right, well, we're going to go ahead and stop this now, but uh, feel free to, uh, if you ever have any questions, contact me, Jonathan Kelly, at J-O-K-E-L-L-E-Y at A-L-A dot org, or Nanette Perez at N-P-E-R-E-Z at A-L-A dot org, and we'll put in uh, in the YouTube archive some of the uh, things that we discussed, some links that we discussed during this broadcast. All right, thanks again, everyone. Have a wonderful... Thank you.